Welcome to another episode of One on One with Mitch LaFon. I am your host, Mitch LaFon. And yes, it is that time of the year where we get to tell you that it is brought to you by the one and only Heavy Montreal taking place not over two days, but three days this year, August 7th, 8th, 9th at Parc Jean Drapeau in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And this year, we've got Slipknot, Faith No More, Corn, Lamb of God, Iggy Pop, and I will mention it on every plug I do, Warrant, Dokken, and Lita Ford, because those are the bands I love. And of course, uh, joining me this week to talk about all of this is Russ Dwarf. Good day, Russ. How are you? Good day, Mitch. I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Now, the snow's melting. Oh, I know. And uh, I, I should also tell you who our guests are on the show. First up, Russ, you're going to love this one. From Night Ranger, the one, the only, Jack Blades. He is in a new band with Doug Aldrich, formerly of uh, White Snake, and of course, pr- currently with Burning Rain. Uh, and uh, Dean Castronovo from Journey. The band is called Revolution Saints. I think the album is fantastic. Uh, and Russ, I believe you've heard it too, right? I haven't had a chance to uh, oh. hear it yet. Well, wow. because you you never sent it to me. But uh, <laughs> anyways, there you go. That's a whole other story. But you know, I those are great. Uh, these guys are great uh, artists, and uh, Jack is uh, an amazing singer and uh, yeah. uh, frontman. Yeah, you know, I think you particularly love what he did with um, Damn Yankees with Ted Nugent and Tommy Shaw, right? Yeah, I think they, that was a great band. They were so tight. They only did a couple of records, but, uh, you know, the singing in, on that record is amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and Night Ranger was an awesome band, too, you know. Oh, yeah. What was the, what was the guitar player's name? Uh, it's still on mine. Uh, my, my Watson? Age. Jeff Watson? No, no, no. Uh, Brad Gillis. Oh, Gillis. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I remember seeing, uh, you know, when uh, when Randy died, uh, Brad Gillis filled in for him, uh, and uh, they played at the Maple Leaf Gardens with Brad Gillis on guitar, lead guitar. Oh yeah, absolutely. With 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 Ozzy. And uh, you know, this Revolution Saints album is uh, basically, you know, it started off as a Dean Castronovo solo album. And then uh, the record company Frontier said, hey, let's let's get some other guys, some heavy hitters on this and let's turn it into this band. And it sounds great. I, I you know, I've described it as journey on steroids and, and I'd love to see uh, more. So I can't uh, wait to hear it. Yeah. So, I'll, yeah, of course, I'll send it right over. <laughs> and uh, on the second part of the show. Now, this one is definitely a guilty pleasure. It is the 30th anniversary of the song Walking on Sunshine, which Russ, you're going to sing for us right now. Go ahead. I'm walking on sunshine. Right. See, oh. see there you go. Yeah. And that, you that go. that's a great song. And uh, of course, that's Katrina and the Waves. And uh, I reached out to Katrina. Uh, I've known her for, for many, many years. Uh, you know, when my daughter was born, she sent all kinds of stuff. And and she's also got a new album called Blissland. She's on tour currently in North America. She's got a date on March 29th in Toronto. She's also hitting Buffalo, Hamilton, Dayton, Chicago, Milwaukee, etc. So uh, if, you, if you're in those towns and you're hearing this, certainly go out and uh, check it out. But uh, the other fun thing, and we'll talk about it on the second part, is that Katrina and the Waves were signed to Canadian label Attic Records. And of course, the Killer Dwarves were signed to Attic Records, but uh, we'll get to that in the second part, um, right, Russ? First, let's get right over to uh, Mister Blades, Jack. Works Hello, out well. Mitch. Good day, Jack. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. Thank you for asking. Yeah, and and thank you for doing the interview today. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Been a fan of your work for for many many years, from Night Ranger to Damn Yankees to Shaw Blades, and of course, Revolution Saints now. Well, great. Well, thanks. Thanks. Let's uh, let's rock and roll. Let's let's get right into it. Um, Revolution Saints. You, it's an album that's put together with Doug Aldrich, who's uh, formerly of White Snake, and of course Dean from Journey. Uh, tell me a little bit about how the project came together and why you decided to be involved. Well, I um, the project originally was you know was was brought forward to me. I thought it was a thought it was going to be like a Dean Castronovo solo record because Dean had never um, and never sang lead, you know, on an entire album before. He'd 
he'd kind of just, you know, on, on, on Neil Sean's um, solo album last year, the So You album, right. Dean had kind of like, sort of like tested the waters. He, he sang lead on about I, I three, three or four songs on that record and everything like that. In fact, I, I, I co-wrote the lyrics with Neil on, the, on that whole, most of that whole album. And so, right. so I was in the studio with him when, when he was singing the lead, you know, when he was doing stuff and it was like, his voice is just so good. So when I heard, um, when I, I received a call from um, my record company, Frontiers Records, saying that they were doing this record, and, and would I do, a, do it with Dean? And I'm like, of course I will, because I'd known Dean, God, I've known Dean for t- over 25 years. Right. I, mean, I, I mean, Dean and I have been friends. I mean, his first band, The Wild Dogs, I think was managed by my by Night Ranger's lighting director back in 1984. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And so, uh, so we'd known each other for a long, long time. We toured together many times with... Uh, with Night Ranger and Journey, I'd written songs on Journey Records. I mean, it was very much a, it was very much an easy fit. Yeah, um, and, and now you you don't sing as much on this album. And tell me a little bit about why you you've given up the reins to Dean on this one. Well, I think that the I think that the whole idea of this record was to show that show Dean's amazing. I mean, I you know for the life of me, I can't figure why figure out why he hasn't been a lead singer for the last 20 years you know right. what i mean i mean he, he's such a good singer he sounds so great he's he, he's so you know he's so he's just great you know and and his inflections his 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 um you know his uh, his where he goes and and his instincts and, and everything are just are just wonderful and um and so you know far be it me to like sort of mess with anything like that i i to tell you the truth i kind of like the fact that like Hey, I get to be just the bass player. I don't have right. to. I don't have to be all things to all people. You know what I mean? I can be the. I can be a bass player in a band and and just be just be the bass player, which is kind of cool. I mean, I sing on a couple things, but but I I was actually um, I thought it'd be kind of fun because it's something I really hadn't done since right. since my days as Rubicon back in 1977 and 78 and 79, I think or something. Um, where where do we go from here with the band though? Is this just a, a one off and that's it, folks? Or do you well, think... not not really. I mean, okay. I think that we're um, we're actually fielding offers right now for some live shows, right. and um, and it looks like that um, you know the fall if 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 we all have time in our schedules that the fall might be the best you know in October or something like that, that there'll be some live shows. Um, oh, that'd be you know, wonderful. Um, yeah, and also we're talking about actually getting together the the three of us and just slamming down and 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 jamming and and writing some more material and. Um, Sometime in August, we're trying to figure out like a three or four day period in August. We can all just get together and just like start playing, you know, and which would be fun. Yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to it because this is by far uh, one of the best albums released so far this year. And I think by the time we get to Christmas, it'll be in the top three of best sort of melodic hard rock albums. It really is a special album. Um, Alessandro and Serafino over at Frontiers had a lot to do with the the song selection, the writing of the songs. Uh, you even covered a, a Swedish band, Eclipse, with the song To Mend a Broken Heart. Um, was it a bit different for you to not be as involved in the songwriting process? Well, yeah, it was, um, it was very, um, it was kind of bizarre for me. Not bizarre, but it was, yeah, it was a little different because you know, I mean, it said, okay, this is, these are the songs that we're thinking about, how these songs sound. And we're, uh, you know, Dean's like, yeah, they sound okay. And as long as Dean thought they sounded okay, I'm like, well, you know, it's your, it's your thing, man. You got to sing them and everything like that. And then, when, then when this thing evolved, I mean, you know, Doug Aldrich came on board mm-hmm. and I've, I've just admired Doug's playing from afar for so many years. And I've always wanted to maybe, you know, get together with him and do some stuff with him. He's such a great, you know, guitarists in the line of like you know you know neil sean and you know i've been very fortunate to play with some great guitarists from you know ted nugent to brad gillis to tommy shaw to you know jeff watson to you know to just just great and now you know uh talk matsumoto from the group bees in japan right. i mean just some phenomenal guitar players and and I'm, I'm telling you doug is just one of the one of those kind of guys that has that instinct again i'm talking about those instincts where he he knows right when to like burn and right when to pull off and hold that note like mm-hmm. nugent does you know right at the right time like neil sean does and, and it just and so it was very exciting and this thing sort of like once doug got on board the thing kind of like morphed into a into sort of more of a band thing right. you know um but at that point it was the the wheels were already rolling um i you know i 
I co-wrote, you know, I rewrote the, you know, I wrote all the lyrics on the, on the song, uh, Turn Back Time, because it's hard for me to sing something that's going to be like that I can't, you know, that I, it's been a long time since I ever sang anything except for the Shaw Blade stuff that, you know, where those are all classic hits that, that, that I didn't write that I have to sing. You got to believe in what you're singing. So yeah, I, absolutely. I sort of rewrote, you know, the, the lyrics on Turn Back Time and, and one of the other songs, like Dream On or something like that. And, and so, um, um, it was, it was, yeah, it's a little different, man, you know, and that's why we're, you know, we're excited about the fact that, uh, that we can get in and, and just, you know, you know, wrench down on some, some tunes that, you know, that we come up with and everything like that. Yeah, that's why I'm looking forward to a second album where the band will have more input into what, what comes out. Now, you mentioned Tack from uh, the Bees. You, you did an album with him back in 2004. Uh, is that something that you might do again at some point, work again with Tack and, and put together another album? Well, Tak Matsumoto is just amazing. Talk about a talent. I mean, yeah. Tak is just a, an amazing guy. And, and of course, it was with Eric Martin singing and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, the TMG group. And I would love to do that. Tak and I still stay in touch constantly. Um, he's, uh, he's just a, he's, man, that, talk about a, uh, like a, like he's a great human being, too. Right. You know what I mean? I've been really fortunate that everyone I've played with, almost everyone, <laughs> Almost every guitarist or every you know, but I've I've remained fast, fast friends with over the years. So, talk to one of those guys that would be it'd be wonderful someday. But I don't know. I mean, that was like ten years ago. I hope that wasn't just a a passing phase. I see him every time Night Ranger tours Japan. Yeah, and and it was a great album. It'd certainly be fun to see a second one. Uh, speaking of guitarist, Joel Hoekstra uh, moved over to the White Snake camp. Uh, was that a bit surprising? And do you think he's a good fit for White Snake? Well, yeah, we didn't have any idea that that was going on until, you know, like, until, like, we were told one weekend, and it was like, I think all those decisions had already been made, and it was a little, a little bit, you know, bizarre. It, yeah, it was a little shocking for us and everything like that. Yeah, I think Joel's really, um, I think he's fine. Joel's used to playing, you know, he's, he's, he's great at playing, you know, Joel's great. Joel's great. He's great at playing other people's music. He can really do well with that. You know what I mean? And I think their album, do they just release an album or something? It's, or a, it's, coming, it's coming out, out in, in like in, in a month or so. Yeah. It's all like cover songs, right? It's right. all like Deep Purple songs, right? Right. I mean, that's kind of, you know, I mean, Joel's, Joel's real good at, the, at that kind of stuff. And so, you know, more power to him. You know, he's, he's on. We're, we're happy where we are, you know, with Kerry Kelly as our guitarist. Um, Kerry is just, he's brought something it was an easy it was an easy fit to put Kerry in because Kerry had had toured with us when we did a um a um Canadian tour right. with uh um um Journey and um because Joel was doing the Trans Siberian Orchestra stuff so right. we don't we'd always use Kerry in the winter time and and Kerry's just such a great he's energetically fits right in he fits it and so I mean we just went right from that right into you know nonstop touring we just grabbed Kerry and boom it was it was like we didn't miss a beat right to Japan everybody you know, and Kerry just fits right in. So, so Thank hey, you. man, you know, everything happens. Everything happens. So, you know, it's like, that's life, you know. And, and Kerry's a great Get guy. Get over it. Move on. Right? Move on. Yeah, now, uh, yeah, take the high road. Let, let's, let's talk about the uh, 2014 album. Um, you know, w Night Ranger is one of those bands that you could go out and do your summer tour and you would pack what you pack based on the back catalog. Why is it important for the band to have new material and, and, and invest the money and the time into putting new songs out? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's what we do, isn't it? I mean, I've right. chosen as the, my field in life to be a musician. That's why I just, I, you know, it's like, it's hard to understand critics sometime when they go, Oh, they guys should just like, you know, hang it up. Um, no, you shouldn't. Just, you should <laughs> just wash it up and forget it. They're, you know, it's like their heyday is gone. It's like they don't understand. I, I just, that for the life of me, it, it's like, it's like telling somebody he shouldn't write anymore as mm -hmm. a, as a critic. He shouldn't write books. He shouldn't write essay. He shouldn't, you know, his old, his days are gone. It's like, I've, you know, as a, as a musician, I've chosen to be a musician, a songwriter and a, um, um, uh, you know, an artist. And that's what I've chosen in my life. That's what I'll do you know, to the day I die. Right. And, and I'm just going to keep doing what I've chosen to do. You know, I mean, the most inspiring thing for me was once um, Kelly and Lita, Lita Ford and I went and we saw, um, we saw um, Les Paul on his 90th birthday play at the Iridium in New York, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just, that was inspiring. I hope when I'm 90, I'm on a stage in New York or on my stage in a, I don't care where it is. I mean, this is what, 
I do. Right. I, this is what I've chosen to do, and I, you know, I'll do it till the day I die. And so, that, that's to me, it's important to keep creating because I think when you when you stop creating, that's when you start dying inside. You know, what I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I think that it's important, at least for me, it's important to keep your mind creating, keep coming up with ideas, keep coming up with new things, keep coming up with new melodies, keep coming up with new lyrics, keep coming up with all the, all those kind of things. It's like because that's. I think when you stop doing that, that's when you start sort of like, you know, shriveling up inside. Yeah, and, and you know, Critics Be Damned, it was an incredibly uh, wonderful album. I mean, it's just a fantastic well, you. album. You. you know, you look at some of the bands that, are, that, are, that have had these 20 or 30 year careers and their albums at the end, you start thinking, oh, you know, why are they bothering me with this? But not you guys. You seem to just be getting better and better, quite frankly. Um, well, you, you know, Night Ranger just has that theory of just, you know, we, we, when we do something, we do it like 110%. Mm -hmm. We can't. I don't know how to do anything else. Brad doesn't know how to do anything else. Neither does Kelly. You know what I mean? And, and neither does Carrie or, or, you know, I mean, all of us could sit back and just rest on our laurels and just say, yeah, you know. just Well, you could, but, but you really could. It's I mean, not you, inside of us. Okay, because let, let, let's be frank. You could put a 20-song set together and tour the States and have nothing past 1993 on it. I mean, because right. you have that many right. hits. Um, but it's more fun. It's more fun to put the new stuff in. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Let, let me go back to, to sort of a, a semi, I don't want to call it controversial, but uh, 1995, uh, Night Ranger released an album called Feeding Off the Mojo, which you had no part of. When that album came out, were you sitting there going, oh, what the hell? Or were you like, all right, guys, you know what? Everybody needs to make a living. Good on you. What was your reaction to that? And did you ever listen to the album? No. And okay. I've, I've never listened to the record. And the second thing that you just said is exactly, it sounds like that's, exact, that's exactly what came out of my mouth. Right. I mean, I just, you know, I've, I was in the damn Yankees. I was in, you know, I mean, we were in, we were, we were rocking. Tommy mm -hmm. and I just did the, we were going to do the Shaw Blades record, first right. one, the hallucination. I mean, it's like, whatever, everybody do whatever they have to do. You know what I mean? Everybody do whatever you want to do. I mean, I want to deny the guys, you know, an ability to work or something like that. So right. yeah, I wasn't, um, I've never listened to the record. It's because it's really not, you know, it's not something that, that, that we as Night Ranger do now. We don't do any of those songs off that right. record and we don't, you know, it's not something that, that, um, that I was involved in. Um, so, but it didn't, no, there was no, like, what are you guys doing? And it was none of that. It was like, no, hey, no bitterness with it's Kelly and Brad. What's right? that? There was no bitterness towards Brad or Kelly going, Hey, you're, you're our brand. What do you do? None of that. No, no, okay. no. Uh -uh. Um, not at all. Now, at the time you were doing damn Yankees, uh, you know, coming of age and all those songs really made an impact on radio. At some point, do you think we might see more from damn yankees or is that one of those let it be let it, it we had a good time enough's enough you know i i, mm -hmm. I think it would be fun yeah. i think it would be really you know fun and 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 everything like that but i'm i'm not sure everyone else shares my my excitement about that um you know everybody's got their own thing that they're doing right now and right. and who knows you know what i mean i mean i would love to do it i mean we got together once and played alice cooper's christmas pudding as you know as the damn yankees mm -hmm. that was really fun and I, you know, I would love to do it. I think it would be great. And if all the, you know, if we can get everybody together, it's just one of those things that there's a lot of stuff going on with a lot of, a lot of people because everyone is active. I mean, everyone, Michael plays and, you know, he's a, he's the drummer for Leonard Skinner for the last 15 years That's or whatever right. it is. And, you know, Tommy with sticks, they tour every 20 minutes and like, you know, Ted's either, if he's not hunting, he's playing. And if he's not doing that, he's like, you know, on at Fox the News. Convention. Right. So, I mean, it's very, it's very, you know, and me with Night Ranger, we keep, you know, we're doing tons of shows and then I do other things like this and I have my own things and I'm doing, you know, radio show, you know, just a lot of stuff. So, but I would, to answer your question, I would love to do it. And, and I think all the other guys would too. I mean, I still, you know, Tommy and I were texting back and forth this morning. We were laughing and joking about stuff and, and, um, so, I, I, you know, we're all still, you know, still the best of friends. And so who knows, you know? Who knows? L let me ask you about Tommy Shaw. He's in Sticks, you're in Night Ranger, and yet over the last 20 years you've collaborated, you've written together, you were Damn Yankee, Shaw Blades. What does Tommy mean to you professionally as a player, and what does he mean to you as a person? Well, 
professionally as a player, he's the easiest, you know, for me, it's the easiest. It's like with Kelly, you know, that's, that's the easiest fit. I mm-hmm. mean, when Tommy and I get in, get in the room, there's no, there's no figuring out, you know, there's no maneuvering. There's no like trying to figure out what's going on. We, we, it's just instant. It's been like that since the very beginning. And it's still like that when we get together, you know what I mean? Right. As a, as a, um, as a, um, um, person, he's like a brother to me. Right. I mean, in fact, in fact, his, his birthday is like, I, I think the same day that, that my brother was born, which is wow. very bizarre, which is September 11th. My brother was, died of a drug overdose, um, wow. you know, when he was like 25 back in 1977 and Tommy's birthday is the exact same day. I mean, it's pretty crazy, but, um, yeah. um, you know, he just, he just, he, he always will be that, you know, he, he'll just be, always be, it's, he'll always be my brother, you know, he'll always be my, my, my pal. I mean, it was like, you know, and, and, and that's the way it is, which is wonderful to have people like that in your life. You know, it's oh, wonderful absolutely. to have lifelong, you know, to have lifelong friends, you know what I mean? It's just, I mean, how, how, how can that be a bad thing? Especially, <laughs> especially in the music business, because listen, at the end of the day, you you are in competition, right? When you're playing the sheds or you're playing a show, you, you, Night Ranger is is in competition with Sticks, and and so to be able to to get through that and have a, a true friendship is a testament to both of you guys, quite frankly. Well, um, I think that that's the, the 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 fact is that there is no competition. Right. I think that that's the that that might be the 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 a perception from someone outside of where Tommy and I right. and where Ted and I and where Michael and I and where, you know, where we all are, there is no competition. You know what I mean? Right. I want the best for him. I'm hoping the, the best for sticks. I mean, I think it's a great, you know, when, when he goes on tour and they do all their things, I think it's fantastic. I think it's freaking over the top. I'm excited about his, I mean, that's the tour I would go see this summer. Um, Def Leppard and sticks. And, um, what's the, what's the band? Tesla. Tesla yeah. I love yeah. That. That's I love be that. A... And I love those guys. I love Brian. I love, you know, Jeff, the singer and, and, um, you know, the drum, you know, all those guys are just like great, you know, first of all, they're great friends of, you know, I, we kind of came up in San Francisco in the Bay area together. Mm-hmm. They were from Sacramento and, you know, Troy, the drummer and stuff like that. And I, Troy's great. Great. You know, I mean, that's, so there is no, you know, there's no anything. So it's just, it's all, you know, when you're at this, I think when you're at this stage of the game, right. I think that, that it's, it's all about, we're all just doing it because we're, you know, freaking love it. We're doing it because it's rock and roll. I mean, the guys in, you know, the guys that are in, you know, um, in all the bands like Sticks and Night Ranger and Tesla and freaking, you know, I mean, Kiss, you know, you see all these friends that you know forever. I mean, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, the, you know, REO Speedwagon, it's so fun when we cheap trick guys it's like the survivors right it's like at that point there's no competition it's just like it's great to see you that's what it is well you really are the survivors because when you look at the number of bands that have come through the door since the 1970s uh, you know it's it's literally thousands if not hundreds of thousands and yet you've got these 10 or 15 like you mentioned kiss and Def leopard and air that have survived um what is sort of then the, the secret to success? What has kept you around for so many years? I think that I think that this, it's a it's a twofold thing. I think it's good songs. I think mm-hmm. I think good songs will always be around. Yep. And I think it's what's inside the people. I think certain people have a drive that that keep them going. You know what I mean? I mean I know I know a lot of you know a lot of the musicians that 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 you have mentioned and everything like that. There's a drive to just constantly. Do to 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 do better to create to do this not to sit back on your laurels and and just you know and I, there's you know something new let's do this let's do that and and I think that that's there's I don't know man there there must be something inside of all of us like a, you know the guys in Aerosmith I don't know you know I mean you know it, it's like it's like wonderful I mean I, I'm not saying that Night Ranger is up there with uh, you know with ACDC and and Aerosmith and, and, and those kind of things. But what I'm saying is there must be a kindred spirit inside of all of us that want to just keep, keep it all going because it would be very easy just to throw in the towel. Yeah, uh, there really is something. Let me ask you about this. You mentioned uh, in passing Kiss and Def Leppard. Last year, 2014, there was a Kiss Def Leppard tour, and early reports out of management was that Night Ranger was on the bill, and then it turned out, you weren't. Um, what happened there? Um, they didn't want to pay Night Ranger. <laughs> right, and and that that's basically what you I was. You know doing. what I mean? They wanted some opening act. They wanted somebody that would you know that take you know 
$7,500 to play in front of them or something. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of a drag that that, that sort of thing happens. That's why it's so refreshing to see something like, like um, you know, a you know, Def Leppard, you know, uh, six Tesla, Tesla show, because that's a great, that's a great three-way package. It was the same thing as like, you know, journey foreigner night ranger tour mm-hmm. that, in 2011. I mean, all that, you know, that, that was just a great, a great thing that just filled, you know, filled arenas and filled and sheds, you know, right. sheds and filled everything. That was an entire sold out tour. You know, it, it's like, it's too bad guys that, you know, that, and I don't know if that it's, it has anything to do with the bands or if it's just a, a, a you know, a, a management a money, thing or something. bottom line money deal or something like that. I, I personally think it's kind of silly, but that's kind of what, what the deal is. Well, yeah. And if, if you don't mind me just exploring a little more from what I understand, you weren't going to get a, a great payday and that going out and playing the sheds by yourself, you were going to make more money. And in terms of exposure, you who really needs exposure at this point? Everybody knows who Night Ranger is. It, it was sort of a bum deal, and yeah, yeah. I think that I think those kind of things people have to stop. You know, I mean, I would rather see the 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 industry look at at, at this with this at this stage with these kind of bands. I would rather see the industry go. You know, let's put on a great show that'll bring lots of people. That'll be really fun for the for the fans and fun for right. the audience and, and all that kind of stuff. That's what I would, that's what I would, you know, I would love to see, you know what I mean? Instead of just something that like, okay, we have two acts and we're going to take all the money. And then, and then the last, you know, l- let's just get some, you know, some opener that doesn't want a lot of bread and just, you know, yeah, get them a, a sort like of that. pay to play kind of situation, which, yeah, I would rather see it just like, look, raise the ticket price a dollar and then we'll, you know, or whatever, <laughs> just like pace, you know, and just do a great thing. And, and so that's kind of, you know, and, and night ranger, you know, we'll just go out and, you know, we'll, we'll just do our own thing, have fun at our own shows, play longer, you know, and that's another thing when you play, you know, when you're o- the opening act, usually you only get like 35 minutes or something or 40 minutes. Whereas now you can, you know, in night ranger, we can go out and play for, you know, however long we want. Yeah, you know, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because I thought, it, as a fan, when I heard the, the original Triple Bill, I thought, wow, this is going to be fantastic. And then, you know, politics takes over and you go, oh, really? Really? Come on. Come on, folks. But yeah. uh, let, yeah. let's get back onto the positive and, and I'll, I'll end with this. I'll just say, uh, uh, pleasure talking to you. And Revolution <laughs> Saints is an incredibly fantastic album. I hope there are some live shows, and I certainly hope there is a Revolution Saints 2, 3, and 4, because uh, you guys together really put something out that that's unique and special. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, and and um, that's the same way I feel. So hopefully, hopefully that's what's going to happen. Great. Well, thank you, Jack. All right, my pleasure. Absolutely. Bye-bye now. See ya. There you have it, folks, my interview with Jack Blades of Night Ranger and, of course, explaining why Night Ranger, which were slated to be on the Def Leppard Kiss tour, ended up not being on it. So uh, that's always exciting to get that sort of insider info. Let me remind you, of course, that this episode is brought to you by Heavy Montreal, taking place August 7th, 8th, and 9th at Parc Jean Drapeau in beautiful downtown Montreal, Quebec, Canada, with Warrant. Dokken, Lita Ford, oh yeah, and these other bands called Slipknot, Faith No More, Corn, Bullet for My Ma- Valentine, Macedon, uh, Mashuga Testament, Marky Ramon. That should you should like that one, uh, Russ. And and No Killer Dwarfs. I know. Come on. I know. I, I know. Come, I want to come to Montreal. I love Montreal. I know. We, I we, love the I love the food. I love St. Catharines. Come on. I know. Lots of friends there. I know. I know. We, there, there, there's got to be a spot at some point uh, for for the dwarves. But uh, I'm just gonna come. I'm, I'm just gonna come to your house. Yeah, come and hang out. Well, I'll I'll be there. Why not? I could use a well, helper. Set up. Yeah, set up in the living room. I'll walk the dog. See, this is what it'll be. Instead of me being sort of doing roadie duties for you and carrying your guitar case up the stairs like I did in Cornwall that, that time, That's right. like five years ago, you yeah. could come around and carry my microphone or, or bottle. Yeah, I, don't think it was, I don't think it was five years ago, but I'm uh, the, the Cornwall faster. The Cornwall gig was, was. Oh, I think it was only three or four years ago, wasn't it? With Krabby? Yeah, with, yeah, with yeah. The Krab- okay. with, with, the, with the mayor of Mork? That's right, with John Krabby, who's now part of the Dead Daisies. Woohoo! 
Oh, that's another episode. We'll have to get him on. Yeah, absolutely will. So uh, you'll have to get him on. Let's also remind the folks that uh, about MelodicRock.com. Andrew over there has been a big supporter of the podcast and, of course, my writing over the last 15 years. Big supporter of the rock scene. He's got um, melodic rock records where he signs bands and puts out their uh, their their records. He's got three new ones. Um, Empires of Eden with an album called Architect of Hope. Uh, Tonk with an uh, album called Ruby Voodoo and Terra Nova with an album called Reinvent Yourselves. Listen, Andrew does a lot for the site. Please head over to MelodicRock.com. Find these albums. Buy them. You're going to get, first of all, great music because Andrew has very, very finicky ears. He does not put out stuff that he does not like. And since he happens to like pretty much everything I like, you know it's going to be good, right? Right, Russ? That's, that's how it works. Absolutely. It's great. Be supporting, uh, you know, bands. That's, that's yeah. Killer. New bands on top of that. and uh, That's awesome. Now, speaking of uh, new bands, in fact, let's not speak about new bands. Let's speak about bands with history. Let's let, Katrina and the Waves. First of all, can you believe it's been 30 years that people have been walking on sunshine? That is just insane. And uh, she, cats, yeah, yeah, and she's she's great, you know. I, I she's she's just like I said before, always been kind to us. Now, uh, I would imagine because Walking on Sunshine was not the music the dwarves were playing, you probably never got to be on a gig with her, or probably never even met her. But you were on the same mm -hmm. record label. We were, we were on Attic Records, and yep. that was our very very first record, and. Uh... 1983 and i think you said uh she talked about the guy who signed us tom williams who was the vice president of attic records absolutely Ale alexander mayor and tom williams yep. were in charge yep. over there at attic and uh, during the mm -hmm. interview and you're going to hear it we talk about that because their first album for some reason they were over in england they they cobbled together enough pennies or pounds or whatever you call it over there to uh to get the music done and they sent it around all over the world, and some dude in Toronto said, "I'm into this," which is Tom. Yeah, yeah which is Tom. You know, because listen, yeah. you look at who Tom signed and or was associated with or bands. He, he's put out a Motorhead album. Uh, he's yep. put out uh, for for people who may be uh, on the French side, a band called Plastique Bertrand. I don't know if you remember them. Uh, he I was know. involved in the early days of George Thorogood, the early days of Triumph. Of course, uh, the Killer Alice Wars. Cooper. Yeah, uh, yeah. He even had Prakash John Alice as a bass player signed to a band there. Uh, Lee Aaron, the Metal Queen, and of course, uh, Rob. You're, I mean, Robbie. Uh, I was Rob. Say, yeah. Uh, Rob, thanks. Russ. There you no, go. I, I'm thinking Rob Reiner because I know he's your personal favorite from the band. Rob's a Rob's a great friend of mine from the Anvil. band Anvil. Well, of course, and yeah, and he he signed them too, and uh, you know. Uh, Gatto and like a lot of local uh, people from Teenage Head. Uh, yeah. You know, McLean and McLean. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of those guys, but look that up there. They were the original Bob and Doug with the, a little uh, more blue. And of course, if you live in Canada uh, during the uh, 70s, you could not escape uh, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation Television, uh, always had the Irish Rovers on, and uh, they were involved with them too. So, hey. They were a great label, and it was a small independent label. But you know, in those days, if you couldn't get a major deal, uh, they they were always willing to listen. And they were at, down in the trenches. Like Tom is a great guy. Tom Williams, I talk I I talk to him every week still to this day, and he's a great friend. And uh, and just uh, he's retired now, but he's a great music lover. And we we need to get him on the show. Oh, he's I, I, lots of, I lots agree. Of things. He's very funny too. Yeah, because I want to know, first of all, uh, all the stories, but I, I, I also want to know, how do you go from Lee Aaron, Killer Dwarves, and all those bands, and then end up with Aaron Carter and Creed? That's that's what I need well, to know. They, they were an eclectic label. Right? Yeah. You know, they 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 went, uh, you know, they, lo they love music, and it was well, a great... Well, it's sad to see that they're gone and everything, really. I'm, uh, but uh, uh, those two guys were hands-on guys, for sure. Yeah, they did, Alan, and they did a lot, Alan, for the, Alan Tom. lot for the Canadian scene. Really did a lot for the Canadian scene. 
but uh, there you go. Hey, so let's uh, let's get to, speaking of our the scene here. Let's let's get into uh, talking about Katrina. So she's now uh, on her own. She's Katrina, and what what I like is on on the uh, website on the poster it says Katrina X of Katrina and the Waves. <laughs> so it's, it's like, well, you're still the Katrina part, aren't you? <laughs> and I and I love the poster. It's great. It's like a throwback. Yeah, I know. I know. Looks so, really good. Uh, yeah, he, you know, head over to Katrina's web. So it's Katrina with an S web dot com or uh, Facebook dot com slash Katrina's web. So you can check out all the uh, web dates. Check out the uh, the new album Blissland, and of course celebrate thirty years of walking on walking sunshine. on sunshine. We're walking on sunshine. Yeah. There we go, Mitch. Yeah. Which is new albums coming out. I know. Uh, th- this is why I do interviews, by the way. I don't work a stage. <laughs> but here we are. Here is Katrina from, or formerly from, Katrina and the Wave. Okay, where are you now? Set the scene for me. Montreal. Okay. How's the weather there? Um, you know, for Montreal, not remarkably bad for this time of the year. It's about plus yes. six or plus seven, which is not humongous, I know. But at least uh, the snow is melting, and we're, we're we're turning that corner. Good, good. I'm so glad to hear because, you know, I'm getting on a plane the day after tomorrow, and we really yep. need that snow to be gone. You know, uh, walking on sunshine just doesn't work in the winter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. And uh, <laughs> you, you've got a Buffalo gig, a, Ham- a Hamilton gig, a Toronto yep. gig. Uh, you know, those are those are snow regions. In fact. In fact, your entire tour is in snow regions, Milwaukee, Chicago, Lancaster. I know, it's crazy. It's crazy. I feel sorry. I've been following in the, the footsteps of Midge Ewer. We did a, a tour with him last year, and I've been watching his progress and the poor guy. He's had some a couple of shows that were just no-shows because, you know, people were saying, well, to get what normally takes half an hour, a half hour journey is taking some people three hours. And, you know, people just turn back. It's just too much to take. Yep. And I also think by this time of year, aren't you just absolutely sick of it? Oh, totally sick of it. Listen, there was a couple of shows in uh, early February, and it was minus 20 outside. Oh, come on. And uh, they were bands that I like, and I own their albums, and I just stepped outside, and I just went, eh, no, forget it. <laughs> yeah, it's too oh. cold, man. Forget it. it. It's just too cold to rock and roll, isn't it? You yeah. know, forget it. Yeah. So I stayed home, and uh, I sort of, you know, I I missed Zach Wild and I missed uh, John Karabi and stuff. But uh, yeah, you know, hey, what, what, you, what are you gonna do? Well, and, they'll uh, be back, hopefully. You know. <laughs> yeah, I hope. I hope. Sometimes it's it's hard these days, but uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll get around to Montreal at some point. It's been an incredibly long time since you last played here. I know, it's been insane. Well, you know, I didn't even, I hadn't even been to North America for 20 years, and then I joined up with the Retro Futura last mm-hmm. year, mm-hmm. which was uh, Thompson Twins, Major Howard Jones. Yeah. And that was really only because I was asked. You know, I haven't been uh, ignoring anybody intentionally. It's just, it's taken quite a long time to... Um, well, I hooked back up with Rick Shore, mm-hmm. who I used to work with, the, Katrina and the Waves worked with in the 80s when he was at FBI, Frontier Booking. And um, we just said, well, look, you know, anything comes up in the States, uh, think of me. Yeah. And then that tour happened, and so it put me back out there and also encouraged me and inspired me to record my first solo album in 10 years so i mean i don't really know what i've been doing all this time mitch <laughs> i know I, well, I can't really i can't account for it you know well i'm gonna walk you step by step through all of this so we're we're, we're gonna find out of course we're gonna talk about bliss land we're gonna talk about um peggy lee loves london your your okay. wonderful uh, what is it a, a bichon or a poodle or she's a toy poodle toy poodle okay so we're, we're gonna go but you know what we're gonna start Right at the beginning, uh, we're going to go back to 1983, actually, with the Walking on Sunshine album. Um, what was interesting about that as a Canadian is that it was only released in Canada for for a greater portion of its existence. It was only available in Canada, and that came through Attic Records. And, of course, Attic Records had Anvil and Lee Aaron and Triumph. 
Um, just tell me, how, how did you hook up with a Canadian label run by Tom Williams and Alexander Mayer, uh, Attic Records? We didn't have a deal. Right. And we thought we had some good material, so we paid for our first album. Mm-hmm. It's the, the white album with the black writing. It just Correct. was in the waves. Mm-hmm. Um, our manager, Carmina, who was married to our drummer, decided to take this album. We'd made a thousand of them. And uh, the Coopers, that's Alex and his wife. Yeah. By the way, let me just we, mention that, because when I first saw that you had Alex Cooper on the album, I had mistook it to being Alice Cooper. And I was like, she's got Alice Cooper on drums? How very I know, <laughs> and there's also there's another Al Cooper right. with a K who's a drummer. So it's very confusing. <laughs> Alex's real name was Tommy Cooper, but right. there was a really famous uh, comedian right. who you really wouldn't want to be mistaken so for or confused with. So <clears throat> Carmina and Alex remortgaged their house, little house in Cambridge, and we got the money, we put it together, and we recorded an album at Alaska Studios in, um, in London with Pat Collier, the bass player from the Vibrators. Right. And Carmina took it to Medem, which is a music festival yep. similar to the Cannes uh, movie festival yep. and there are a bunch of guys there including al Mayer from attic records and he had heard of us through the grapevine took an interest in the group and signed us Im- immediately and so immediately we took the very first album and attic wrote walking on sunshine in red i think on the top mm-hmm. because they thought well that song has potential and then we spent the next three years until we got signed with Capital going from the east coast of Canada to the west and yeah. back again and back again and back again. And this is where we really we really learned to, to get good. It's our, our very first tour. My fondest memories of everything I've done in the music business were those, those tours, Mitch, because it was like we could all finally quit our jobs and I was, uh, I think, as you know, I was a dishwasher for five years uh-huh. at the Chow Hall on the Air Force Base um, here in England, Milden Hall. And I could finally quit my job and be a musician, be a singer. And so we got in the little Ram van. We had our all our Canadian crew, Dave Hart, tour manager, Paul Tozer doing sound. And everybody took turns driving the van through blizzards, uh, you know, um, tumbleweeds. <laughs> we all got our coonskin caps. We sat there. We had our our Sony professional Walkmans mm-hmm. and listened to our little cassettes. Grace Jones, I remember, had come out with a phenomenal album, and we were all listening to that. Driving through the night with our little cost headphones. And, you know, it's so I remember every detail in every hotel. Those really, really were the good times. Beyond that, the Bangles covered a song of ours called Going Down to Liverpool, yep. which made uh, EMI prick up their ears. And we were signed, and the rest is history. Yeah, you know, you, you were going so much so through Canada that for, for a point, you were almost mistaken as being a Canadian band. I mean, people just thought, oh, that's the Canadian band, because you were here, like you said, for those two years. Uh, where, where were you based? Did you actually live in Canada? Were you, were you in Toronto or Vancouver, or did you just sort of fly back in from London all the time? We may as well have been. We had to fly home to back to England to just, just to pay bills and to gotcha. catch up on everything and also to record some more material. And by the time we were signed with Capitol Records out of L.A., mm-hmm. thanks to the Canadian team of EMI, um, we had to go back to England to record it because uh, there wasn't really any talk of us going out to L.A. to record it. and It just it didn't make any sense. And the, the the best we did with the albums was to get them mixed with Pat, um, sorry, with Scott Litt in New York at the power station. And that's where you get the fantastic drum sound, which we got mm-hmm. in uh, Walking on Sunshine. And it was also Scott Litt's idea to 
uh, open the song Walking on Sunshine with the drums because our version just started with ow and right. then you were off and he came and he said trust me you guys you're going to love it and so he put the, the drums at the beginning and we were blown away yeah now now the first album you know it did a little bit of uh, of business then the second album Katrina and the Waves 2 did a little bit of business again on Attic Records um how do you get over to, um, uh, what am I trying to say here, to EMI or Capital in March of 95 and get the Katrina and the Waves album put together? Because now you decide, okay, we're going to re-record some of these tracks. Just, just, just tell me, walk yeah, me through really, that you, Yeah, you know what happened was we were lucky enough to be in a situation where we had recorded the two albums for Attic. So when Capital came along, we pretty much took the best of right. what was on those two albums. So the first album we made for Capital, the one that was released worldwide, was already, in a way, kind of a best of album, which is, I think, what, what made it very, very strong and, and very good. And we did have to go back into the studio and re-record some things and restructure the songs and kick some out and whip some up into a, a better shape and then um, obviously go in and get them mixed to the hilt because our recordings were pretty rough and ready because mm -hmm. the studios where we were doing them in London, <laughs> they were no frills. You know, these places were uh, were pretty grungy. But, you know, it worked for us. We were a, kind of a grungy band. Yeah, you were. Um, so what is it about Walking on Sunshine, the second version, that attracted all the attention? I think it was the right song, the right place at the right time. It was never meant to be the first single as much as it was always, it was always liked, you know, in the early, early days when the song was first written and we put it in the set when we were playing around the Air Force bases and Royal Air Force bases in England. We took it out of the set because it was a it was a dance floor emptier. People just they just didn't like it. It just rubbed them the wrong way. So it took a while for the song to 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 find its way. And that summer of 1985 was a scorcher. Yep. And it was it was a beautiful time of year to be coming out with a really fresh, optimistic song. You know, it was that time in the 80s where there was a lot of prosperity, and there was a lot of a lot of money being thrown at musicians and albums and so much money was thrown at the band to, to help it along and get plays on the radio. And um, it was kind of such a novelty song that by the time the summer came in 1985 and everybody was feeling pretty good about life, it was just it was so much fun for the DJs to put on, I think. And also there was this little mini invasion of British artists. So Capital were trying to make sure that everybody in America knew that two of the members of the group were English. So whenever we did interviews or anything, it would always be me and one of the English guys. Yeah, and, and 85 was such a great year. That, that, you know, that's when sort of the, the music industry had righted it, itself. As we got out of the 70s, we had the disco and the punk and the heavy metal bands were, were falling apart, and then they started... Re by 85, everybody seemed to have found their little corner, which, which was great. We, yeah, absolutely. And you think that we were nominated, for example, we were nominated for Best New Artist in 1985, and we were up against AHA, Sade, you know, with oh, her in, incredible <laughs> album, yep. um, Julian Lennon and Freddie Jackson. I mean, these were all newcomers. And so it was, uh, you, you could see that music was strong. You know, yeah. people were coming out with really, really good stuff, and there were some, some iconic albums, um, you know, happening on the radio at the time. And uh, it, was, it was also a time when things were getting quite stadium as well. That was one of the challenges for us to come out of seeming like a little garage band to trying to expand ourselves and we hooked up with Don Henley yeah. who was very slick and he had that fantastic album of, you know, with Boys of Summer, Boys of Summer and 
Dirty Laundry and all those great tracks. And that's when we felt as if we needed to up our game and kind of present ourselves in a more professional way. I don't think it worked. (laughs) (laughs) And I see my current tour and I see I'm back in, in little 200 to 400 capacity clubs. And we're just a little four piece. So all that glamour and everything. And I'm kind of back to square one. Yeah, which is which is which is a nice place to be, I think, to, to sort of reinvent yourself. But let me let me just go back here to to walking on sunshine. Is there such a thing as a song just being too big or too identifiable? Uh, because after that, waves, break of hearts, pet the tiger, and, and the albums after that, there wasn't that one single. It wasn't until Walk on Water came out that you have Love Shine a Light that that you know had a spark, but. It, it, you do, do you just become the Walking on Sunshine band and every time uh, you go into the record company, they go, yeah, I don't hear the next Walking on Sunshine. Go go re-record some more stuff. Is that sort of what yeah, happened? And that's, uh, yeah, and that's why we came up on the second album with a song called Sun Street, right. which did pretty good business in Europe because immediately everyone could identify with the song. It, it's us, and it's got a summery sunshine theme, right. and therefore people liked it. But it was certainly a nail in, a co- in the coffin of the group to follow a novelty song with another novelty song. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we had colossal battles with every record company we were with because after the second Capitol album, we were dropped like a hot potato. There was the whole payola scam. And it was at that point we started courting a lot of European labels, and we were with Virgin, EMG, Polydor, uh, Warners. We bounced back to America with SBK, and we had a a small hit with a song called That's the Way. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it was very, very tricky. We were always following in the wake of the success of Walking on Sunshine. So after it was a, a success in America and Europe, then it started taking off in the Far East, and then in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so we just found ourselves constantly going around. Even when we were on our second or third album, it was almost as if we were still promoting Walking on Sunshine. (laughs) The song just wouldn't go away. And then, of course, it's included in lots of movies, and then later on down the line, Dolly Parton covers it. Last year, there was a movie called Walking on Sunshine with Leona Lewis. Mm -hmm. Um, Beyonce did a mashup with it. I mean, the song is just, it's just not going away. It's going to live way, way, obviously way beyond me. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Know, I, I asked because I, before he passed away, I, I had a chance to speak with Doug Feger of The Knack, and I asked him about My Sharona, and he said that that song was like a golden albatross around his neck. No matter what he did afterwards, fans and record companies said, yeah, but I don't hear my Sharona. And he found that artistically very frustrating. But then he would vacation in the Bahamas and sit in his Beverly Hills mansion home and go, yeah, but this ain't so bad, right? <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, and, 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 you know, bless him. Doug was such a sweet guy. He yep. was a friend of mine. And yep. we toured together in Europe. And he was he was very, very sweet. But you know what else? He had a really good sense of humor about it. I went to out to Australia with him. Yep. And... He just, you know, he just had a good time. He didn't really care. You'd get over it. I'll tell you. But, when it he, but he hated it for a while. There was a, there was a period there where sure. he hated it. And then he said, yeah, you know what? Look at the yeah. life I'm living. Can yeah. I, can you know I really what it complain? You, it, 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 well, you know, it bugs you the most when you're trying to get a second album out and mm-hmm. third album. And all people want to talk about is Walking on Sunshine. Yep. I mean, Mitch, look, we are 30 years, 30 years. Later. Past Walking on Sunshine, and we're well, still talking about theoretically it. Theoretically, <laughs> 32, right? For Canadians, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so, and, but it's such a great tune. I mean, uh, it has, you know, listen, uh, I'm 46 now, and I was around in 85 and 83 and all those years, and I saw the video on Much Music more times than I can probably count. And today it's a sunny day in Montreal, and that song started playing through my head, and I have no reason why. It just it just pops in there, and it's like, yep, here we go. And well, see, isn't it? It's it's probably a great idea for anybody listening who's an aspiring songwriter. Come up with something that's 
seasonal, you know, or, or you know, something like Manic Monday, mm-hmm. something where there's always going to be another Monday, there's always going to be another summer. Those songs work. Or try and make it happy, because Walking on Sunshine, it always held the top spot for happiest song until Pharrell came along. Now it's dropped to number two. I know. But, <laughs> it but, took a while. But we'll see how it goes with Pharrell now after what recently happened. Um, there's a couple of songs I want to ask you about that, that aren't yours, but you, that you sang back up on. Uh, Don't Follow Me with Hanoi Rocks in 1983 with Michael Monroe. Uh, what, what was it like? I mean, they were going to be the next big thing. Then there's a car crash. Razzle passes away. Uh, the band goes through some turmoil. But what was it like? And how how did you get on Hanoi Rocks? I mean, here's a f- band from Finland or, you know. Well, we were doing some some shows around. There was always a, a club called the Moonlight and the Starlight. And those mm-hmm. are two that you've always played in London. The Moonlight is, in fact right down the road from me. I didn't even know when I moved here where I am in London that that was the Moonlight because it's had a couple of other um, names names, and now it's uh, some kind of pub called the the Railway or something like that. So we were doing a show there and Hanoi Rocks came by to check us out because they had been working in Alaska studio or Pat Collier, our old producer, (laughs) brought them along and we had a few beers together, and they said, we're in the studio tomorrow, Can you? and we, we need somebody to come and sing some backup vocals. Would you come? And I said, yes. And it was kind of as simple as that. And then we did Don't Follow Me, I'm Lost Too, and I just it sang it a couple times. That was it. We had a few more beers done. I think I may have sung on one other song on the album, but I, I don't really remember. Yeah, I mean, what, 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 you, just said, you just look at that, and you go, wait a minute, what the... That, that, that those two bands don't go together, so that, that's an interesting story. Then, um, in 1997, Natalie and Bruglia, you had the song "Torn," which became an incredible smash hit. Uh, how did you end up being on that? Well, Katrina and the Waves recorded "Torn" a year before Natalie because oh, okay. Phil Thornalley, who was one of the writers and one of the members of Johnny Hates Jazz back in the day, and my neighbor who lives down the road, he was, uh, he was working with Natalie. And because Torn didn't work out for Katrina and the Waves because we wanted to record all original material at the time, um, he said, look, I'm recording it with this Australian actress. And she's done the lead vocal, but she flew back to Australia because she didn't want to sing the backup vocals. She's, she's had enough. She's gone. <clears throat> so would you swing by and, and stick some vocals on that for me? And I said, yes. And it was kind of as simple as that. He has a, a studio in his basement, right, kind of next door. And, you know, it's one of these things I've sung on a lot of backup records for Phil. I didn't really think anything of it. Just went and sang it. Right. Um, so let, let's stay with 1997. Eurovision. Big moment. Uh, yeah, okay. So the Eurovision Song Contest, for people who don't understand what in the blazes is going on... It's like American it's, Idol, it's, but better. Well, oh, <laughs> well it's... <laughs> now, right? now, people over here think it's really, really cheesy, and you can, to your detriment, be involved in it. Right. But at the time when we were asked if we had a song to contribute to this colossal event, which is... It's sort of like Miss Universe, but with songs. Yeah. And a lot of uh, European countries come and and they are represented by an act and then the whole world votes on what's the best song out of all these songs. Well, we had a song called Love Shine a Light and we uh, took part in the competition and we won. And so that song, Love Shine a Light, did extremely well for us. We are very, very lucky. Uh, From a chart point of view, it did much better than Walking on Sunshine and Well, we were on Top of the Pops four weeks in a row, live on Top of the Pops, which was sort of unprecedented. 1997 was a quite kind of a revolutionary time for the United Kingdom. It's when they voted in a a Labour government, and there was this big feeling that there was this song, Things Can Only Get Better, by D. Ream. And everybody felt like, uh, we were on a positive roll and things were going to really work out for the country. And P.S., we just won the Eurovision Song Contest. 
So that was a pretty wild thing to do. And, um, you know, it comes around every year. And so every year my phone rings. Well, what do you think of the song the UK are doing this year? It's kind of a difficult thing to explain to people who don't know what it is, but you can probably check it out. It's in May and it will probably be on the internet somewhere. Yeah, of course. Were, were you um, were you surprised that you won? Were, did you think the song was good enough? Were you confident? Hey, it's a no-brainer. We have the best song, no doubt about it. Um, yes, I felt very strong okay. about for our, our chances to win um, because the song was very, very catchy and the right sort of song that would win Eurovision. You have to have a song that's got a certain amount of life-affirming cheese to it, and so this <laughs> was absolutely perfect. Because the lyrics go, we're all going to shine a light together, all shine a light to light the way, brothers and sisters in every little part. It was almost like a religious song. It was very, very, very uplifting. And a lot of the other songs, the contributions from other countries, I know they're putting forward their very, very best, but to the people from either North America or England, where we can afford to be a little bit snobby about music because we produce such great music, Mm -hmm. Uh, some of their other European music seems uh, pretty mediocre. Right. Yeah. Listen, when when you have uh, England and the States, uh, you know, they they give you the Beatles and, and, and all, you know, Black Sabbath and all the bands that have been around for ages and ages and you're up against somebody from Belarus. Yes, exactly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I have a little more confidence in, in what we're doing. Um, and then before we just get on to the new album, uh, Blissland, uh, I just want to ask you quickly, let's go into 1999. Rick Wakeman uh, plays for Yes, and you were on his uh, guest vocals on the song Ride of Your Life. Uh, were you a big Yes fan? And and again, was or is this a, another one of these where producer said hey can you are you available and you said yes kind of thing um my i had an older sister who was a big yes fan so there you go. um i kind of i got a little bit of that but i didn't take it terribly seriously it wasn't really my cup of tea i was more into listening to uh female singers right. but i did a agreed to do a, a charity thing for rick and he was doing a a record launch at the Natural History Museum in London, and he just said, um, "Look what you! I'm putting, I'm doing this album. Bonnie Tyler's doing a track, and a couple of other guys are doing tracks. And mm-hmm. I've got this track I think would be perfect for you. Would you come and and do it? We set a date, and I went and did it, and that was it. <laughs> ah, great times. Um, you know, I see that we're already at half an hour, so I don't want to keep you here all day. So let, let's get into Blissland. It's the it's the latest. Um, what can folks who, who haven't heard it or haven't followed you recently, what can they expect on that? Are we doing Walking on Sunshine? Uh, walking on Sunshine. I'm losing my, my speaking ability. Walking on Sunshine or Love Shine a Light, or are we doing something completely different? What, what, are, what are folks in for? I'm doing something completely different. It's my first solo album right. in 10 years, and I had a limited amount of time to write and, and uh, compile the material and record it. I wasn't sure what I was going to get. I ended up with some uh, songs that I'm very proud of. There's some very rocking stuff on there and very contemporary, meaningful lyrics to who I am now, what my life is like now. My new single is called Sun Coming Upper, which is my response, my modern response, 30 years later to Walking on Sunshine. I get so fed up with, with bad news and... 30 years of, you know, as your listeners will know, trials and tribulations of normal everyday life. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I wish I could get back to that feeling that the, the lyrics go and nothing is going right. I need a sun coming up. Or, and it's sort of saying like, I need that feeling I had from, from walking on sunshine, the innocent good times where I didn't feel so, so burdened by um, the threats and fear and uh you know what's going to become of us i just wanted something light and with some sunshine so i mean there's there's a lot of that in the album it's just you know my my take on what my last 30 years have been yeah and and quite frankly i'm with you i, I would like to go back to 1985 not because i'm some kind of nostalgic but just 
the world seemed a lot simpler. You, you woke up, you turned on MTV, you watched a couple of videos, you went and played outside. I mean, you, yeah. know, you, you didn't hear about all kinds of tragedies and, 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 and I don't even want to mention what we see in the news these days. Uh, yes. it, it was just such a, I don't know, it just seemed, seemed a lot simpler, didn't it? Yes, but I think it's also because we have so many more means of hearing yeah. all this bad news, and it obviously uh, attracts people's attention to certain headlines or certain news mm -hmm. problems if you feel as if you're being told or shown or given something that's absolutely essential. There's always There have always been wars. There have always been hard times. There have always been threats. And our, our times now, I don't think, are that much different from the past. It's just that there's bad news is sensationalized so much more. And I don't want to live my life feeling like I have to be fearful or that it was so much better back then. Because there's the, the beauty is now, you know, you can touch it, you can have it. And sometimes it just means you know, switching off the TV and, and just connecting connecting with people and and you know go to a little park or or get yourself a little dog or something to love something to find beauty in again and not uh, not fear and trepidation i don't want to live like that yeah you know what let's let's move away from that and, and and finish off with this the the wonderful collection of images of peggy lee loves london and you can also follow at peggy lee loves on twitter um the story of your Poodle. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of as simple as that. Right. <laughs> yes, I, I've lived in London for a couple of decades now, and I see the tourist books, and I always say, no, 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 there's a better cafe than that, or there's a better pub than that, or I wish people knew about this place because it's fantastic, or this bakery, or this coffee shop, or whatever. So I took pictures of all of my favorite places in London, and the model for the photographs is my little toy poodle, and her name is Peggy Lee. Right. And I put it together as a book, and it's called Peggy Lee Loves London. It's really all my favorite things. But who wants to see my mug? Right. She's so much cuter. I agree. Well, I, no, I don't agree. That, that came out wrong, but I agree. <laughs> what I meant is that but if she you're, is if cute. You're thinking about coming, if you're thinking about coming to London and you don't know what to do or where to go, it is it is a genuine guide because it gives you the addresses and uh, the easiest way to get there and what to order, what to get when you uh -huh. when you get there. Yeah, and other than Twitter, there's also a Facebook page, and of course you can head over to Amazon and buy the book. But uh, with the upcoming tour, the uh, North American tour, will there be a uh, Peggy Lee Does Tour book coming up or some pictures? Will, will, <laughs> Is she coming yeah, with you? Yeah, Peggy Lee does North America. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see about that. I'm going to be a little bit busy with the music, but it's it's kind of in the back of my mind that Peggy Lee needs to come up with something else and quick. Yeah, yeah, I think we, we need to do a European tour. Peggy Lee loves Paris or something. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, mean, I think it's an yeah, adorable idea. The, yeah, like Dublin or Edinburgh or yeah. someplace like that. Yeah, or if you come back to New York for a while, it's... I think it's an adorable thing, and, and I've looked at the pictures, and we have a dog, which is a, a Bichon Frigé, which is sort of looks, oh, about, right. looks about the same, right? And, yeah, very uh, similar. And so uh, I, I could just sort of see my dog doing all the, you know, the toucan and all these places that you've taken pictures of, you know? Yeah, exactly. Oh, the toucan is a fantastic Irish pub in Soho. Yeah. Really good. And they've got these incredible stools down in the basement that look like gigantic pints of Guinness. Right. But you've got to buy the book to see it, to believe it. It's brilliant. Peggy Lee Loves London. Thanks for mentioning it, Mitch. Yeah, and Peggy Lee Loves dot com. I, I, I had to mention that. I, I just thought it was, it was adorable. And, and like, <laughs> like we were saying, with all the bad news we see on TV and stuff, I, I got to say this is refreshing. It's, it's nice. to It's a, I don't want to say quirky. It's just a, a different angle on a tourist book or a guidebook. It's, you know, and it's and a, sweet. Yeah, it it's, is. It's, it's sweet. And it, it brings a smile. And I think yeah, there's a lot to be said for that now. Yeah. So, so as much as walking on sunshine brought a smile for 30 years, uh, this, this is the next big thing, I think. <laughs> so there you well, go. Okay. We'll see about that. <laughs> well, we'll hope. Uh, but, you know, yeah. always, a, always a pleasure to talk to you. And, and, you know, it's been much too long, I think, like I said before, uh, 
it was the last time was 2003 when my daughter was born. So we, we need to... I uh, know. I remember that. Yeah. How is she? Wonderful. Absolutely oh. wonderful. She's uh, finishing elementary school, ready for high school coming up in September. She's, you know, she's, she's, not, she's not daddy's little girl anymore, right? But, hey. Oh, how sweet. Yeah, but uh, it goes fast. And we had a son also in 2006 since that time, so... Oh my gosh! You, congratulations! Thank you. Yeah, we're we're up to two, and uh, it's enough. But they, it's it's a good yeah. it's a good even number, and and uh, yeah, everybody's happy and healthy, and uh, you know, hey, there you go. It is. I mean, we. I was one of six kids, and once you get up to that number, I mean, forget about getting a decent seat in the car. You yeah. know. Yeah. You're or, in the back. Or, or, or any time in the bathroom, right? especially back in those days where there weren't all these safety belt laws. They would just stick you in the back window and say, try not to roll out when I turn. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had this <laughs> long bench seat. My mom had this old 55 Cadillac that she inherited from her father, which was a, just a catalog of disasters, this car. But it had the long bench seat in the front. And because there were eight in my family, we could go four and four. Yep. And seatbelt schmeat schmelts, you know? It. Yeah. Yeah, it was just like, hey, you know, when we hit the corner, just try not to fall out the window. And if you do, <laughs> eh, we'll pick you up later. You yeah, know, I remember. I remember. We, uh, yeah. So you know, the, fun. the back window, uh, we would, I would lie on the back window. And of course, anytime somebody would hit the brakes, I'd go flying towards the front. And, <laughs> But that, that, that was the 60s and 70s, wonderful uh, boys and girls. That's it. That's it. Good old days. And yet we survived. So We there did, you go. indeed. But, uh, you know, certainly a, don't be a stranger. Let's, let's do this again soon. And uh, if you get anywhere near Montreal, I would love for the entire family to come out and, and support and, and have, you know, you know. Thank you, Mitch. You've always been so, so supportive. Year after year after year, I, yeah. I very, very much appreciate it. You're very and the welcome. best of luck to you. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today. Absolutely. Thank you again. And we'll talk soon. See you soon. Yep. Bye bye now. And there you have it, folks. My interview with Katrina, of, or formerly of Katrina and the Waves. You know, it, I've, I've had 30 years of saying Katrina and the Waves, that to, to say the formerly of uh, sometimes it trips <laughs> me up. But uh, hey, you know, some, some great stories about Attic Record, uh, great reminiscing about a, a very powerful song like that. And uh, of course, let's quickly remind the folks that all of this fun today has been brought to you by Heavy Montreal, taking place August 7th, 8th, 9th, 2015 at Parc Jean Drapeau. For more information, head over to heavymontreal.com. And of course, if you do make it out to the festival, you'll get to see bands like Arch Enemy, uh, asking Alexandria, Cold Chamber, Nuclear Assault, Glass Jaw, Mastodon, and uh, I'll, I'll say it every time, Warrant, Dokken, Lita 4, because those are the ones that I will be standing to attention to without being disturbed. Uh, and of course, Fozzie, uh, you're, you're a big Fozzie guy, aren't you? I love Chris. He's a great guy, and uh, he's a he, he's a dwarf fan. He's had me on, on his uh, satellite show. I don't even know if he still has it. And he forgot Faith No More. Did, well, did I not mention Faith Again. No More at the beginning? Well, okay. You've uh, also got Faith No More. Well, uh, you know, like I try I, I try to switch up the bands as we go. I know you Lamb do. of God, Faith No More, Corn, uh, and of course. Um, well, I'll just say Doc and Lita Ford and Warrant again because those are the and No Killer there. Dwarfs. Well, I can't control that. There should be killer dwarves. I'm, I'm all about the killer dwarves doing it someday. I know. I, I am too. It, but we'll be at Mitch's house on uh, one of those days. August 6th, 7th. Then I'm going to send you home. Well, I think I'm going to be in 80s in the park. Anyways, that's another day, folks. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, you're doing 80s in the park. We'll, we'll talk about that on the next episode. But yeah, there you go. Wasn't, wasn't it refreshing to hear, Katrina? You know, we do a lot of the hard rock, heavy metal stuff. But sometimes, yeah. man, you just got to you gotta pay homage to to a, a, a lady and a song that, you know. it. Yeah, it's it, nice to be eclectic, right? And uh, in spring yeah. coming in Canada and the sun is out and it's good, and, you know, and it's. It's a song that you, you would hear, and, and you, you're not going to be, oh, that's a bummer. If you were around in 1985, you heard that song 
ad nauseum. You heard it everywhere. It became part of your mental soundtrack. Mm -hmm. As soon as the, you know, it's cloudy outside and then the, the sun breaks through, you go, woohoo, I'm walking on sunshine. And you go, oh crap, there yeah. it is again. But no, it, 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 it's just a fun, fun song. And it's just, it's always great. I mean, I hadn't spoken to Katrina probably in uh, 10 years or so. And uh, uh, like I said, when my uh, daughter was born, she, she was there, uh, not, not in the room, but she, she, she sent notes and stuff. <laughs> Well, hey, wouldn't that be interesting? Okay, um, you're digressing. I know, I know. Anyway, well, it's the end of the show. All right. Say whatever you want at the end. You can burp again if you want. All right, okay. I can burp again, yes. No, I'll, I'll burp later. There you go. It, and, it's, it's always great to talk to you, Mitch. Uh, another fantastic show in the can, and, uh, you know, I hope to hear from you soon. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we will we will do this soon. A lot of great guests coming up, so keep listening. Uh, George Thorogood is coming up. Uh, James Kotak of the Scorpions. We have got, um, boy, uh, uh, who else? Uh, Jeff Scott Soto. Uh, just uh, tons of people. So there you go, folks. Thank you now. Awesome. Thanks, Mitch. Good night, sir. Cheers. <laughs>